everybody. My name is Ruth Nichols. Um, today, I want to talk with you all about what I did through the Young Scientist Program with the Blue Marble Space Institute. So under the guidance of Dr. Rafael Lorero, I worked on the Space Agriculture Laboratory Analysis Database, or SALAD for short. So space agriculture and astrobotany is a small but growing field of research that looks at plants in space and other extreme conditions. And it has a number of research areas and focus areas, some of which I'm going to try to break down here. One area of research is studying how plants grow in space. This includes studying how radiation, microgravity, and isolation affects them. Scientists want to understand how it affects their growth, their genetics, and their behavior. And they do this in order to feed astronauts and to feed people back on Earth. We also have some scientists who do regolith studies. So regolith is the alternative to dirt on other planets, such as the moon or Mars. So some scientists study simulated regoliths made in a laboratory, and some use actual samples such as those from the Apollo missions to grow plants in them and see how they grow. And they do this in order to prepare for growing plants on other planets in the future. And then we also have radiation studies, although not necessarily tied to space. Some scientists will intentionally expose plants to different doses of radiation to try to induce beneficial mutations, such as disease resistance in different crops. And then we also have the emerging use of technology in space agriculture and agriculture on Earth. For instance, we see more use of AI and machine learning in crop growth monitoring, and we also have drones and satellite data. And then the one that I'll be mostly talking about today is kind of similar to irradiation studies, but using the conditions of space to try to induce beneficial mutations in plants. This is called space breeding, and I will be talking about it more in a minute. So in summary, you can say space agriculture involves utilizing advanced technologies and methods to cultivate plants in the unique environment of space, where conditions such as microgravity, radiation, and limited resources present significant challenges. So as I mentioned, SALAD stands for Space Agriculture Laboratory Analysis Database. The database, its goal is to synthesize all the research ever done across the world on plants in um, space. But we also have a Wikipedia that describes different growth chambers and historic spaceflight missions related to space agriculture. And the Wiki also has a newsletter that um, describes these different growth chambers every month. That's a link to our website. And here's a screenshot of what the database in Wiki look like. The database has a lot of information, such as the name of the experiment, the researchers involved, the length, the time of the experiment, what crops they studied, and what the results were of the experiment. And the Wiki describes different crops used in space agriculture and different growth hardware in a way that general audiences can understand. So why salad? One, uh, one reason for salad is to promote unity and standardization in the space agriculture field by putting all of the information in one place. And this helps increase accessibility to information for both scientists and the general public alike. And that in turn can help facilitate more research by encouraging people to get a better understanding of the state of the art of the field. And this also helps archive research from historic space flight missions. So currently it has a lot of NASA and US data, as well as some Russia data, but it does not have a lot of data from other parts of the world. Even though there are many countries that have active space programs and do research in space agriculture. So my goal was to focus on a country and to add their research to the database. So in my instance, that country was China. China has a very active and ambitious space program, and they also have a very large population of about 1.3 billion, making up 20% of the world's population. But they only have 10% of the world's total acreage. So having so many people, but so little land for agriculture, they had to look to alternative methods. 
So for them, the solution was going to space and doing space breeding. So this is a rough diagram showing the process of space breeding. First, they send up a variety of different seeds into space to expose them to these different space conditions. They don't let the seeds germinate while in space, but they'll return them to, to Earth. They'll germinate them here, and then they'll look for the plants that have beneficial mutations, such as disease resistance or higher yield, and then use those to create new mutants that will eventually go into the marketplace. And then I don't want to bore you, but I do have some statistics about China's space breeding program. Since 1987, China has sent over 30 batches of seeds into space, and it's cultivated more than 700 kinds of space crops. In addition, China ranks first in the number of varieties of space breeding in the world and has created more than 30.5 billion USD in economic benefits. It has doubled the yield and shortened the growth of different mutants. And interestingly, 30% of the strawberries in the Beijing market are aerospace strawberries. So these are some rough statistics to show the role and the power China has in the space agriculture sector. So now I want to briefly talk about some of the different research missions that China has done in space agriculture. Uh, please pardon my pronunciation, but first we have the Fan Hui Shi Wei Xing, which was China's first recoverable satellite program. So they had a number of these from number nine to number 21, flying between 1987 and 2004, but each satellite was up for only five to 10 days each. They grew a variety of different species, such as rice, tomato, and green pepper. Some of the results have in included increased vitamin C, chlorophyll, and mitochondria in green pepper. They saw a higher yield in earlier flowering and a mutant of rice, and they created a variety of new mutants from this of rice, wheat, and other species. After that, we have the shirt gen, which is China's first satellite dedicated to seeds and plant science. So specifically, this was the shirt gen 8, which was set in about 2006. They had about 152 species, including cotton, maize, and sunflower. Some of the results, they saw increased germination in most of the species, although it didn't change in some of them. And even in a small number, it decreased. And the majority, the rate did increase. And then they used a CR39 detector to measure how much radiation the plants were exposed to. And it was found they got about 4.44 ions per cubic centimeter every day. And this research verified that space radiation can cause genetic changes in plants. So then we have the Shenzhou the Divine Vessel Unmanned Spacecraft. So this also had a number of them from 1, 5, 7, 8, 14, and 16 between 1999 to as recent as 2023. They've grown green pepper, watermelon, corn, and other species. Some of the results of this, they saw earlier heading stage, bigger ears and grains, and a lot of disease resistance in some rice. They saw a shorter growth period in some species, and they also did the German Sinbox experiment, and this was the first collaboration with a European country. So this is an image of the growth hardware used in the German Sinbox experiment. The goal was to study how microgravity affects the genetics of plants. It was seen that it, it both upregulated and downregulated many genes, even genes not related to gravity or microgravity at all. And then we have the Tengong, the space station, um, specifically the Tengong 2 um, that is currently being built. We have species such as lettuce, rice, tomato, and Arabidopsis. Here is a rough. Um, diagram of what it looks like. Most of the research is done in the Wen Tian module on the right. And interestingly, this was China, one of China's first times actually letting the plants germinate in space. So that you can see here an image of some lettuce that was grown on the space station. And then we have the Tung -e Lunar Lander in Pro. We have uh, number four and number five. Uh, that were in 2019 and 2020, respectively. 
So they grew rice, oats, alfalfa, and other species. I'll start with the tongue uh, four lunar lander. So this was significant in being the first time plants were sprouted on the moon and is considered the first biological experiment on the moon. Although the plants weren't grown in the lunar regolith itself, it was grown in a habitat in the lunar lander. They were able to grow cotton and maize. And then we have the tongue of five um, probe. It sent about 2,000 seeds into space for 23 days in orbit around the moon for about 15 days. And then they returned them back to Earth to germinate. So that's my presentation. Thank you all for listening, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Great job, Ruth. Um, if there are questions, you can drop them in the chat or raise your hands. Sanjoy has his hand up right away. Ruth, that was super interesting. I, I didn't realize the, the, the Chinese program was so active in agriculture. That's fantastic. Um, is so we cannot reproduce space radiation on Earth. It seems like expensive to send these seeds into space, recovering them. Like, could we expose them to radiation on Earth, or is there something special about the space radiation that is needed? Uh, any insights would be lovely. Yeah, I think you definitely can simulate different levels of radiation on Earth, although that is also very expensive. Um, and but also, I think. Um, being in space has the radiation, but also the microgravity in the isolation. So it's kind of a culmination of various effects that cause these mutations. And um, I think the biggest thing is, yeah, exposing them to all of those at once. We had one question in the chat. Is there a reason that China's data wasn't in the database? Yeah, I'm not sure. I think... Even when I was doing my research, sometimes it's hard to find information about what they do, um, whereas the NASA data may be more accessible, more talked about. I feel like a lot of people don't talk about what China is doing. So um, yeah, it was kind of hard to find all of that information.